Welcome back to another Craftsman's Corner video. Thank you for joining me. In this video, we've got quite a few topics to cover. The first is going to be the Kitchen Island video, and I've got some notes here. That's why I keep glancing away. But on the Kitchen Island video, I've got different comments and questions and just things that I'm sort of reacting to about what other people have said that I'll go over. Um, so first, we're going to talk about the lumber I used. Um, all of it was very accessible lumber. As I stated in the video, the top was yellow pine. The base was mainly made from spruce 2x6s um, and then some uh, half inch birch plywood and luon. And that caused uh, a variety of different uh, sort of questions and comments. One of them being that people were surprised that you're able to get such a nice looking top on the island from yellow pine, uh, you know, construction material. But I think with uh, the yellow pine, it's all sort of in the name. Uh, when you say, you know, a 2 by 10 or construction wood, people kind of automatically think of a different thing. But if you phrased it, you know, I've, uh, you know, um, some high quality ye southern yellow pine, it, it's the same tree. Um, now, now, granted, when you go buy that lumber from uh, Lowe's, it's a different thing when you've buy bought some kiln dried yellow pine um, that uh, is more of a furniture grade as far as the tree it came out of and how it was dried. But uh, you can, if you are careful, pick some very nice pieces of yellow pine uh, from Lowe's and Home Depot to use in your projects. And um, I was pretty particular about the way, uh, the grain orientation and the pieces that I picked out so that when it was all glued up, you saw that quarter sawn um, edge. And it makes it look much nicer than seeing those cathedral shapes that you get so much between the hard and soft grain in, uh, in yellow pine. So uh, sort of just how you use the material um, can be more important than the material you use. And uh, so, um, so that's that as far as the top goes. As far as the frame goes, I had some questions about, do I let the wood sit around and, and kind of acclimate to my house before I work on these projects? And with this project, both the top and the lower part of the, uh, the base of the Kitchen Island, I did not. I just um, go ahead and build it. But that was due to the nature of this particular project. If I was building a table with legs that were only connected in an apron and they were going that 25 inches or so to the ground, not supported by any rails at the bottom, and I wanted to, you know, have them be thin and out of a 2x4 and it was going to be painted in the end, I would probably be a lot more careful with that because that wood, uh, especially as you cut it, you've thinned it down so you might be kind of revealing some stress in the wood. I'm sure most of you have seen that when you're ripping something on the table saw and one of the sides of the rip just wants to curl off to the side or it pinches really hard. That's because that wood has some sort of tension built up in it and then by you cutting it, you're kind of releasing it. So it's going to start going in whatever direction um, it wants to go. In my experience, the most stable uh, pieces of wood from Lowe's are 2 by 6s I don't know whether why exactly my guess is just due to the sort of efficiency of how they cut it out of the actual logs in the milling process that those 2 by 6s just are sawn out of a more stable area in the tree or the direction of the cut. But that's just my experience. And it comes down to the uh, same for the knots too. I just noticed in general, the two by six lumber seems to be a higher grade between a two by six and a two by four. And then in a uh, two by tens and all that stuff, uh, two by eights, tens and twelves, I think the two by tens um, seem to be uh, the best value. But once again, that's just me from my experience and my opinion. So you can do whatever you want with that. Um, so as far as the base goes, the reason that I don't let that wood acclimate in this case is because it's all just in a boxed up frame. Everything is all glued and trapped together. So the wood is not going to really go anywhere. Um, the only thing you do have to kind of think of in certain situations is shrinkage in the width of your pieces of wood. But in this case, any larger areas, um, in between, like the panels in there were all plywood. So that's not going to do anything. That's stable. Uh, so basically it's just all smaller and square components. So it's, it's fairly stable, so I don't have to think about it quite as much, any sort of shrinkage or just general movement. Uh, as far as designing the piece, I got asked if I use SketchUp or do I draw it all out or anything like that. That particular project, I did not. I just um, had some different parameters that I knew I was working with to start with, which were the size of the kitchen, place to put the microwave, and the kitchen only has uh, one drawer in it. So I needed uh, more drawers for storage 
and a place to put the microwave and then just in general I wanted it to be as big as I could for the kitchen so other than standing in the kitchen and imagining that top um, uh, everything else was sort of up in the air and so I just sort of knew that it was going to be closed in because I wanted to hide everything that it stored the height I wanted the same as the countertops which is 36 inches uh, so from there I just started making it I made the top and I used I made the top out of that uh, yellow pine because my wife wanted it that way she's seen a couple other islands that I made using the yellow pine and she liked it a lot my original idea was to use some older reclaimed heart pine that I have and that would look really nice too but I'm happy with the way this turned out and I still have that other lumber sitting there for a future project so I think it was a win-win um, the finish on the top is polyurethane. I got asked that even though I show that in the video, but I just wanted to restate that it's polyurethane. I put some polyurethane on, let it dry, sand it, uh, put more on, sand it, put more on, sand it, and do that as many times as it takes to get the sort of the protection and finish that you want. Uh, in my case, it's three or four is normally how much I put on there. Uh, and sometimes it's more than that, but that's because I thinned it down so each coat is not as thick. Um, and uh, but yeah back to the design I didn't kind of finish that when I'm uh, making these pieces some things I just kind of go at it and I make them and I'm reacting uh, throughout the process to sort of what's happening and different ideas that I come up with usually the project changes three or four times throughout uh, the whole thing certain details do so I'm not one to really want to nail anything down and uh, just to end up being disappointed that I wasted my time trying to uh, work it out on paper instead of just working it out here in the shop. And with a lot of the projects, um, the project sort of stays in sort of a bone form for so long, meaning just like the framework. So you can come in so easily and change things with the way you do your drawer fronts or the way you do the panels, uh, for example, in the kitchen island. There's a whole lot of uh, small details that you can change at any time or towards the end of the end of the project to get a look that you want. Um, but as far as this project, I just built it. There's other projects where I pretty much 90% uh, of the project is fully planned out before I get started. And, uh, and then um, and, and, and some of these questions kind of got sparked from me posting some pictures of some of my ideas and sketches on Facebook lately. And, uh, but a lot of those projects, a lot of times I'm just drawing stuff to draw stuff and I might not um, build it right off the bat, but I might come back to that project later and build it or I might just pull a detail from that project so in my mind and I basically just typed this to a fellow on Facebook is um, is sketching is just a way to sort of uh, work through different ideas um, and just working out different ideas and thoughts you may have um, about uh, different things you're interested in so it might not be that the thing you're drawing is important but it could be a small detail of that is important and a lot of times this is where I've noticed that the sketching has come in the biggest parts. I think I've got a great idea and then I draw it out and it looks horrible. And it's not because of my drawing skills most of the time. It's just because in, in my head I'm thinking about it differently. And then, But once I kind of actually have uh, something to look at, it doesn't look as good. So I've uh, sort of saved myself some uh, hard work for nothing um, before in doing sketches. But when it comes to really simple stuff like the kitchen island, it's just a box um, so I know what it's going to look like completely in my head uh, before I even get started in most cases um, so yeah that's that uh, and another question I got in that video was tool related I think I got uh, several comments and that is about the track saw mine's a fest tool but it doesn't matter what kind of track saw you have um, and in general the question in the comments were is am I enjoying using it is it worth it and for me it's a hundred percent and once again, this is to any track saw. They're all pretty much the same, except each one's going to have uh, sort of uh, different specs as far as how deep it can cut, etc. And uh, and then the price tags are different, of course. So if you're just looking for an occasional track saw that you want to use, just get one that sort of suits your needs that you can afford, whatever that may be. Um, but it works great here in the shop. You see the shop behind me; it's not that big. So when it comes to ripping down four by eight sheets of plywood and uh, joining a straight edge on on boards whether they're small or big it really is a nice uh, nice tool to have here in the shop um, so 
I think that pretty much sums up all the details about that particular video. Another video related question was uh, what software do I use for editing my videos? I use so Sony Movie Studio and I think it's uh, the 11th edition. It's whatever the newest edition is and um, which is uh, it's October 2015 right now. So at that time, whatever the newest edition is, you just go to Sony's software site and they'll have it on there, whatever the newest one on there is. I think it was $100 or $140, somewhere along the lines of that. And I had the previous edition or several editions ago. So when I got this newest edition, it was an upgrade. So it's just, and you just download it. You don't even have to wait for them to send it to you. And it works with Microsoft and uh, Apple too, I believe. Um, and then on to a sort of a bigger topic of the video. I know it's been going for 14 minutes now, but um, it's pricing of furniture. I, since I post the videos of my farm tables and talk about other pieces of furniture that I make and sell either directly to a customer or through stores, I get a lot of questions about pricing. And I know that that is often one of the most challenging things um, about uh, making and selling things is the actual pricing aspect of it, but it's really not all that complicated. And I know people just want me just to blurt out exactly how much I, I sell things for, but it's, it's a lot that has gone into kind of coming to those prices that uh, it can be misleading if I just say how much I'm charging something for, because I can sell something here where I live for one amount, but if I drive just several hours to where my wife is from, I could probably sell this stuff for twice as much. Um, so, it can be this exact same item, but sell for so many different uh, amounts just due to location. And then on top of location, not that I'm uh, well known by any means, but sort of uh, who you are can even make a difference. If you've been in an area making a certain thing for long enough, you're going to create a demand. And you can have another guy making the exact same thing, but you might be able to sell yours for more than he can because uh, somebody might in particular want something that you made, um, not just they want the table, but they want a table that you made in particular. A lot of times people just like what you make and that's all it comes down to. But um, you do end up over time sort of uh, gaining a reputation for what it is you make. And um, so that affects the price some. Not a ton in the average man's uh, world, but uh, it can uh, make a huge difference once you become uh, more famous for doing whatever it is you're doing. Um, other things that affect price, you know, the materials you're making things out of, uh, sort of the construction techniques. But for me, it's location and how much, it, how much time it makes you to take something and then pretty much um, do to that location the most you can sell it for. And that's what I do. And I'm not into making inexpensive stuff. And I've said this before, um, but I've, I feel like if you can kind of be on more of the high end, you just have a much more pleasant experience because the person that you're selling to can more easily afford it than if you're selling a low price item. I find that you, and there's nothing wrong with this, but uh, the lower price items will attract a different crowd and oftentimes that person, it's a more of a, it's a bigger decision for them to buy that item than it is for the person who can totally afford it to buy a more expensive item. Um, so I find that it's a lot easier of an experience for me and uh, and it just makes you more money. And oftentimes, the amount of time that it takes to make one thing versus another thing that might sell for a different price, it's not that much time. So I would rather focus on things that cost more than say, uh, working my you know what off to sell cutting boards. I'd rather just make a larger piece that I can sell in, um, for a larger price tag. Uh, so yeah, I hope that was a little bit helpful. I know that didn't answer anything, but I'm just touching on it here. And I do have plans in the future to maybe make some specific videos. But in the meantime, if you do have any questions regarding that topic, I will do my best to help. And I have talked um, actual numbers to certain people, have sent me pictures and showed me what they're making and told me where they're living. And um, I've kind of helped them out come up with some different prices to start at. And then they can kind of work up from there I guess that'll, I'll let that be my last thing. Uh, let's just say that for what you're making and where you live, the you, you don't know this when you get started, but let's just pretend that that sweet spot for how much you should be selling your thing for, let's just say is $1,000. 
but you know you're excited about what you're making and you've seen some stuff online selling for you know four thousand dollars so you go well you know what you know i can't sell it for that much but i'm gonna try selling this for fifteen hundred dollars well your five hundred dollars over sort of the sweet spot you might sell whatever it is for fifteen hundred dollars but you might sell one every six months whereas if you drop it to that thousand you might you might sell two or three a month and and so in lowering the price you can make more money and uh and then, and then so in charging however much you charge, you're kind of, uh, you got supply and demand affecting that. You can raise your price, but then people might not buy them as frequently. So you can kind of control it. I've got my stuff priced in a way where I sell stuff uh, semi-frequently, but not super frequently. And that's what allows me to do the other things like make this video and other videos is because I'm not just, uh, if I priced my stuff uh, $100 or $200 less, it would potentially probably double my orders, but um, I don't want to have that much of that, that work to do, because all that work does when I make a farm table, it just makes money. And so it just takes all my time to make money, and a lot of times it's just money just for normal everyday stuff. Um, and. So I, I, I don't want to kill myself over just being an average person. I'd rather um, price my stuff to where I can make however much money I need, but allow me to work on my bigger ideas that I have that could lead to much better things than just making uh, as much money as you could possibly make making some farm tables or something, for example. But um, well, now I'm rambling. So the way I'm going to finish the video is I'm done with all my topics from questions and comments. But I wanted to show a little bit about the shop. Um, there's been a fair amount of progress going on, but not a ton. Each little section of the shop that I improve, I end up spending a lot of time in there right afterwards. So I should probably uh, refuse to do any kind of projects or work on anything other than just getting the shop done. But I'm not a strong enough person. So we're going to start out uh, kind of looking behind me at the benches for the radial arm saw. Well, you've already seen this in a previous video where I have the radial arm saw, and of course in the Kitchen Island video you see me using it a lot, but I have extended this workbench, and so from right here to about where, well, to right here where that clamp is, this is eight feet long, and this is where I put my DeWalt radial arm saw, and you can see the general idea. I've got the fence runs across the back, and I'm going to talk about all this more later, and then there are spots for drawers and then doors where I'm going to put some shelves on the front. But I have expanded it. You can see right here, I've expanded it down. This is about four feet. It's a little less than four feet to the corner here. And that's where the second uh, saw is. And these are matching saws. They're the same. I actually had the opportunity to buy a third one of these from the guy I bought this one from. And I paid $75 for it. And he had another one he would have sold for $75. And I should have bought it. I don't know why I didn't. Um, I have two of them. It would have been good just to have it on hand for if one of them broke, but it would have probably just been good to set that one up too. Um, since I've gotten this radial arm saw, I have no idea how I didn't um, always have one. I use this thing, shoot, it's probably one of the most used tools here in the shop now. And that's a DeWalt MBF, and so this one is too. They are nine inch radial arm saws. And you get about, I think, 14 or so inches of uh, cross-cut capacity. So this one is um, the same as this one. It's a little dark over here. You'll have to just work with me. The construction of the bases are the same. From here down, it's one unit. From here down, it's another unit. Well, you have the top part and the lower part on both. And you can sort of see roughly how it's assembled. I've got the M uh, MDF um, uh, is the table and it's bolted down. I've got these little leveler things built into the design. And uh, most people do this thing called a Mr. Sawdust Design. Uh, most of you who are radial arm saw people probably know about that. But I just kind of came up with my own thing. And it's similar to what his design was. But I just kind of simplified it. And um, I find for the way I have it set up in these workbenches, I'm getting extremely accurate cuts. So I'm very happy with the way, um, with the way it's worked out. So uh, this isn't totally set up yet, but the bench space is there. And then of course I need to do all the drawers and the doors on these. Then, uh, so junk has just been, well junk's sitting there now, but junk was just sitting on that concrete pad there for quite a while. 
So I went ahead and threw this bench up the other day. And so these benches are going to stay with me, whether I'm in this shop or another one. But then these bench, this bench down here is more built just to fit this space and I just wanted to get it done kind of quick. So that is just made out of two by fours and three quarter OSB. And it's only actually a single thickness, but on this front edge, I doubled it up and then recessed the frame back in there to where I can clamp to the edge of that, depending on what I'm working on. And I was gonna put drawers under it, but that would have taken additional time. So what I'm just gonna use that for is just kind of tucking stuff under there. And for the boxes that different tools come in, it works out great. So it's my jigsaw, little Colt router, router bits, tools, some clamps, and uh, just these types of boxes just can be shoved under there. And uh, just in general, while you're working, you can kind of set your little tools you're using right on that and uh, keep them out of your way. But the top of that's gonna be skinned out just like this with some masonite. So that masonite will wrap around giving a smooth surface. And then I'm gonna band the workbench in just an oak strip just to kind of protect that edge. And then I can't open it up right now. And like I said, I'm gonna show all this later in sort of a overall shop video is this is in the end is not gonna have stuff sitting all over it. I'm just gonna keep this uh, as clean as I can at all times. So this whole lid hinges up in the inside of that's like a box. So I'm gonna store things that are more supplies that you don't have to get at all the time, but um, just things that you need to shove somewhere. Um, so yeah, so that's that. And the tools that are actually gonna go on this workbench are gonna be the mortiser, that spindle sander you see in the back uh, right here, and I've got a disc sander, and uh, just general sort of bench top type tools will go on top of that, but ones that can be sort of shoved and slid around uh, as needed. Um, but in general, I just like a lot of workspace for different projects. Uh, it kind of helps keep things organized because like, you know, you, you go to, for example, you go to your crosscut sort of station for these ready arm cells. I go to them all the time, but then I end up doing stuff like this. I'll set that there. I'll set, you know, just different stuff, just get sat on it just because it's a flat surface. And then every time I need to cut something, I got to move all that junk. So um, as I put the drawers and then all the shelves in, I'll, I'll have places where most things are stored. But for right now, stuff just gets thrown everywhere. But it's a good example of if you don't have enough workspace, you'll end up using whatever workspace is available at that moment. And it ends up kind of slowing you down big time. And for me, with certain projects like my farm tables, I'm not just in here for fun. I'm just trying to move along and get, it, uh, get the job done and, and don't want to waste my time cleaning stuff up all the time. So um, having as much workspace over there, here, the workbench, and then right here where all this lumber is, is another area. I'm going to end up having my drill press up on something over uh, right around in here. And um, this is sort of the same thing too. It's got that weird concrete um, block there. Then I've got a lot of lumber stored. And this is the lumber actually from the video where I, it was called Urban Logging. It was the sassafras and ash tree. All from here down is all the ash and from here up is the sassafras. And then behind me is the crotch um, in a little room. But uh, that's being used in a different project right there. And you're gonna see more on this uh, project coming up soon. And then I've got these uh, sheet materials for building all this stuff out. Uh, and then the other thing I'm gonna do is all around the top, I'm gonna put some sort of shelving on the wall um, in the back and then in that corner probably, and then across the wall here. So there's gonna be places, to, I'm gonna have more places to put things than things I have to put away. And that way, at least when I do clean up, it's not like a huge challenge just to figure out where to put something. Um, so that's that for this side. The, well, the only other, other thing is I've kind of started uh, getting my ceiling a little nicer. And yes, I definitely should have done this before I did anything at all in the basement, like painting the walls and the floors, but I didn't. Um, so I'm kind of taking care of it now. It's kind of a rough looking ceiling. So I've kind of, I'm going in there and I'm uh, hitting it with some joint compound and it's a rough ceiling. So it's not going to be perfect in the end, but I'm going to smooth it up the best I can and get it painted. And when I sand it, which is the messy part, I'm just going to rent one of those sanders and hook it up to the vac and uh, do it dust free. That's what I did upstairs and it worked great. So I'll be able to sand this whole ceiling out without getting the joint compound powder absolutely everywhere. Um, 
And then this is what's new. This has, uh, I don't think I've shown this at all yet. Maybe a picture on Facebook, you could see that I had the lathe set up. But this is my metal working area that I've set up. And that is one of the other big things that I do and um, just enjoy doing in general. And when I see metal working, it comes on several different levels. Um, this is my metal lathe, and I've been fooling with that a lot lately, making different things. I've been helping one of my friends work on some invention he's coming up with. Uh, which involves several aluminum components making a uh, part that he's kind of uh, designed. Um, and then over here is going to be sort of a smaller scale, uh, a small scale jewelry um, scale like work area. Um, so silversmithing type stuff, uh, mainly working with non-ferrous metals, brass, copper, uh, silver, gold, that type thing. Um, and then the other thing is doing some engraving. So most of you probably know what engraving is. Things like, uh, this is just a little practice plate, but this type of, this type of stuff. So different scroll work and stuff like that. But, uh, so um, I'm doing this stuff in a couple different ways. Most of it is just uh, with hammer and chisel, using these different little carbide chisels, just grind them out myself and then a hammer and I actually made this hammer that's a cool thing to talk about real quick that hammer head was made on the lathe so it's only stainless steel so it's not a hardened piece of steel but i only use it for as a just a chasing hammer but i'm using it for uh, just hammering on the backs of these chisels which are um, wood so you don't you don't mess the hammer up and then that engraving is just done in this vice here it's just a ball vice it's called an engraving block and then you wear these little goggles. And so that is just up on a piece of, um, that's a bunch of uh, yellow pine, just laminated up. I screwed and glued each section together. And then it's just, so it's really solid on the bench here. The bench is pretty solid. It's two layers of OSB with uh, two layers. Of, so it's an inch and a half of OSB total, the masonite on top, and then I banded the edge all around with the oak, just to kind of reinforce that edge. Got plenty of support under that side. And then I want to kind of uh, close this in around this corner with some sort of drawers. Maybe a bank of drawers going down here, bank of drawers going down here, and a shallow drawer across here where you'll sit. And then that's an air compressor. And I just got that. And um, that is, uh, came out of a dentist's office originally. I didn't buy it from a dentist. I got it from another guy and I have no idea where he got it from but um, it is an air compressor for dental tools and it is super duper quiet. It, uh, it's normally $1,500. Um, even if you buy one used that's been sort of reconditioned or something, they're about $1,500 and I bought that one um, for $100. I found it on Craigslist, he wanted $150. I talked him to $100 and I'm very, very happy. All I did was added, um, added the regulator. So that's just a regulator from Lowe's. Um, but yeah, so this whole thing is just a case that air compressors in there. So you just lift the little shroud. This whole thing just picks off the top and it's a little like five gallon pancake style compressor uh, tank with the oil uh, compressor on top. So um, like I said, it is super quiet. It sounds like a sewing machine just running under the bench. And the reason I got that is because one of the other engraving tools is uh, that unit right there, which allows you to use these pneumatic tools, which um, I'm kind of new to using this stuff. This stuff I'm much more familiar with. But, uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the engraving stuff in the future too, because I might use, kind of integrate that into some of my furniture pieces and other things that I'm making. Um, so I think that's it for over here. Just got some different, it's gonna be a lot more going on with this, different shelving and storage. Um, same for this. I might make this wall look a little more interesting somehow with some shelving or just doing something cool with it. And then I'll try to end the video real soon. This has been big change over here too. Um, this, if you remember, it was just super piled up. I mean, it was bad. It was all my lumber that I used for my farm tables was just kind of stacked up over here pretty rough. And um, so what I did with that is I cut them all into sort of their more efficient links and I know it's dark and then I made this as a wood rack here on the wall just out of two by fours and so I've got uh, eight foot boards, seven foot boards, five and six foot boards and then miscellaneous junk on top. 
So when I need to make whatever size table, I come over here and I grab the stock I need and then I can plane it here. I just have been leaving my planer set up over here. I made this little base for it to raise it up so I'm locking casters. And then I've got the dust collectors over here, the trash can dust collectors down there. So I can go ahead, plane my boards out and then carry them around the other side to the radial arm saw, cut them to length and then use the track saw to join it. So that has been uh, a big help in kind of making that process a little more efficient. And then I got my motorcycle tucked back in here. And then all that junk, the kayaks and the saw horses, this lumber, it's over here as a microwave and a bunch of other junk. None of that stuff's going to end up being in here. That's going to go outside um, under a porch on the side of the house once I close it in. So that will be good to kind of get all that stuff out of here, which will make this side of the shop an actual kind of a workspace and not just this holding, holding place for junk. Um, so yeah, so I guess that is it for this video and um, yeah, I covered everything. So I know it was super duper long, but it's been a while since I made one and I've kind of done several videos um, recently that I kind of uh, wanted to talk about a little bit and then showing the shop. That was uh, quite a bit. I think this video is going to be 35 minutes or more. But uh, if you do have any questions from what I talked about or would like me to uh, cover anything in particular in the future, just let me know in this video or any other video and I'll do my best to include it. So. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Is anyone still watching? Well, if so, and you're not already a subscriber, click the red button on the screen now, and you'll get updates when I post future videos. Thanks for watching.